Hello everybody and good morning. Welcome to our third little uh, tutorial for photographers, for beginners, amateurs, those of you who want to know how to get off the auto settings and do a little bit more creative photography. Well, <clears throat> this session is all about attempting to obtain the best exposure possible. In other words, to obtain a, a well-lit photograph. So we're going to have a little bit of theory to start off with. It won't be boring. I'm going to make it as easy as possible. Then lots and lots of examples for you to see uh, how this was put into practice. So looking at the screen now, you'll see my attempt at drawing a triangle. It's not brilliant, but it's going to make the point. <clears throat> there are three elements to every exposure. And what we're looking at is what I'm calling the exposure triangle. You can Google it and you'll find out a lot of information if you so desire. So our very first graphic, three elements to every exposure, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Now the last two weeks we've looked at the shutter speed and we've looked at the aperture. And today we're going to be looking at ISO together with how all of these work in harmony with each other or should do to create a really good exposure. So each element, aperture, shutter, ISO, it's all about manipulating light. The aperture is the size of the lens opening. It controls the amount of light that enters the lens. So the larger the opening, the more light will come into the sensor. The smaller the opening, the less light. So whenever we hear aperture being discussed, it's all about the amount of light that comes through the lens. The shutter speed controls how long the shutter is going to be open for. It controls the duration of light that's allowed to hit your camera's sensor. So the longer the shutter speed, the more light will enter. The shorter the shutter speed, the less light will hit the camera's sensor. Now ISO controls the sensitivity of the camera's sensor. The lower the ISO number, the less sensitive the sensor is to light. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive it becomes. Now these three elements, they work together to generate an exposure value. You can't always manipulate one setting without having a direct impact on one or both of the other elements of the exposure triangle. So let's take an example. Look at one of my bird photographs taken yesterday. It was a bright, sunny day. This first photograph, aperture was f8. The shutter speed was 125th of a second. ISO was 400. Now, you'll find that the image is too bright or it's overexposed. Now, in that instance, we've got a couple of choices to rectify the situation. So look at this second photo of the pigeon. It's moved slightly, but it's in the same tree. I need to reduce the amount of light so I could use a smaller aperture, say F11. Remembering I was using F8, the higher the number goes, F8, 11, 16, 22, and so on. The higher the number goes, the smaller the aperture hole is. So I could use a smaller aperture of F11. That will restrict the amount of light coming in. Or I could use a faster shutter speed, say 1 250th of a second, and that will reduce the duration of light that hits the sensor. Third choice I could use a smaller ISO, say 200, and that'll make the sensor less sensitive to light. 
Now, you wouldn't adjust all three. You'd choose one. What is your result wanting to be? Do you want more of a blurred background? Uh, if so, you adjust the aperture. Well, actually going higher, it will make the background clearer in this instance. Now, if the image was too dark, an opposite action would be necessary, such as using a large aperture, uh, a slower shutter speed, or a larger ISO. Okay, so if the image was too dark, you would use a larger aperture, change the shutter speed, and ISO. So part of what exposure is perhaps a little bit difficult to understand is the manner in which the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO are all measured. So our next graphic shows you all three elements are measured using stops. One stop equals a doubling or a halving of the light going to the sensor. So let's consider the shutter speed first. Shutter speed is measured in fractions of a second, like 1 250th of a second. Moving one stop up makes the shutter speed 1 500th of a second, which is twice as fast. Moving one stop down would make the shutter speed 125th of a second, which makes it twice as slow. So it's easy to see how the stops will either double or halve the light. So that's a shutter. ISO is measured in whole numbers like 100, 200, 400 and so on. Moving from ISO 400 to ISO 800 doubles the sensitivity to light hitting the sensor. Moving from ISO 400 to ISO 200 will halve the sensitivity to light. So the hard part is figuring out the aperture. The shutter speed and ISO are relatively straightforward. So the final part of the exposure triangle is what makes an impact on the artistic look or the creativity of the final image. As shutter speed increases, motion blur will decrease. If you want to freeze movement, you use a faster shutter speed. Conversely, if you want to blur movement, you use a slower shutter speed and pan the camera, as we looked at last week. With regard to the aperture, if you're wanting a blurry background for a portrait, so take a look at this little shot of a harvest mouse, you use a large aperture like f2. If you want a background that is in focus, like a, a landscape shot, I would always be using a smaller aperture, like f11. As the ISO increases, the presence of digital noise also increases. Now, what is digital noise? When you look at a photograph that has digital noise, you will see just how ugly a photograph can be. It looks like grain in the background. If you are wanting a clear image, use the lowest ISO possible. So I would always start out, if it's a relatively sunny or a little bit of a shade in the day, I start off at ISO 100 and then work with aperture and shutter speeds. If there's a little bit low on light, I would increase the ISO, okay? Um, there is one exception to this rule actually about grain. If you're doing black and white photography, a black background with grain can look really appealing. It can be very attractive and such images have won photographic ex exhibitions quite regularly. So let's wrap this up before I give you examples. The exposure triangle. Don't get discouraged. If need be, take lots and lots of photographs and manipulate the settings. Spend a day just experimenting. Get your image in the viewfinder 
preferably let's say on a tripod so you're going to get the identical image every time so you get your image all set up how you want it to appear and get the correct exposure then move the aperture and compensate with uh, the shutter speed or with the ISO play around with them and see the difference you get to your final shot this is where creativity all begins the key is putting your learning into practice and with more practice will come a better understanding of the exposure triangle so I'd like you to look at some examples but before we do how do you measure light you know that's a good question isn't it the camera does it for us and uh, all to do with the sensor where the light comes uh, onto the sensor plate but how do we measure the light that is required now if I'm going out taking photographs of landscapes I will generally have the light meter which is part of the camera it's not a separate item okay I would have uh, it set to evaluative setting which means it's measuring across all the sensors um, on that plate where the light comes in however if I'm taking a photograph let's consider that pigeons the first shot where you'll see it was very very much overexposed because on evaluative it's looking at the complete image uh, from very bright to quite dark and it just takes like an average now to get it to get a better light reading I use spot metering so look at your settings for measuring the light I use a spot metering which is the very very center in the viewfinder where you actually you can adjust where you want that spot to be on the majority of cameras today but I have it in the center so I can see it easily and I am looking directly at the bird and I put the little spot right onto the bird because that's what I want perfectly lit and you'll see the difference in that second photograph so let me now show you uh, many examples of how I've used the shutter or the aperture as a priority how I've played around with the ISO and with regard to the pigeon shot let me show you the difference that cropping makes as well where I've got a big picture of that uh, pigeon you know with the, the tree and the sky to the left which was very bright and just crop the head and just see the difference it makes gives you an entirely different image so let's have a look at these photos now so as we look at this first image of a pretty little flower I wonder three weeks ago would you have been able to determine whether this was a shutter speed a priority an aperture priority totally manual setting what's your gut feeling now well these photographs are all aperture priority the foreground is what we want in focus the background completely blurred aperture priority the little harvest mouse on the honeysuckle that was to be the focus of attention background completely obscured aperture priority yet again now this is a photograph of the back of my camera taken in the garden only a couple of days ago bottom of the bottom line underneath a bird feeder 3200 that's one 3200 per second exceptionally fast shutter speed f9 so that's a mid priority for the uh, aperture and where that white rectangle is on the bird feeder that's what I focused on so that should a bird land and fly off I wanted to take a photograph of it flying off then the focus providing the bird took off in parallel to where I am it should remain in focus so there's a bit of luck in the focus part but that was it one three thousand two hundred uh, shutter priority again I wanted the wings to be in focus shutter priority again I'm looking for uh, good wings frozen in flight as it were shutter priority here you go little blue tip shutter priority without any doubt and I think that's captured the wings 
really nicely. Maybe it could have been a bit faster. And again here, he's left the bird feeder, frozen him in flight, shutter priority. Can you see the creativity that's available when you come off the auto setting? Shutter priority yet again. But notice the exposure, the background very, very light. Here is our little sparrow in flight. Doesn't look it, but he is. His legs aren't on anything. In flight, shutter priority. Now this is an interesting one. I've got the bird and part of the background in focus. So where do you think the aperture setting would have been? Certainly wouldn't have been wide open. So F11. Again, here we are. I've closed the aperture slightly to give the bird bl the bur blurred background, but nice photo of the blackbird. Little baby sparrow in the tree, shutter priority. I didn't want him moving and ruining the photo, so shutter priority. Are you getting a feel for the creativity now? Again, this certainly isn't an aperture priority, is it? I wanted to get the bird in action, shutter priority. Again, shutter priority for this little blue tit. It's a baby one. Didn't want him moving. I didn't want the wind ruffling his feathers too much. So shutter priority. Again, fabulous uh, wingspan. Shutter priority. Background nicely blurred. Uh, couldn't do that with just the aperture. It would be very difficult. Now again, there's a lot of brightness in that background, tremendous amount. So I have metered, light metered on the bird, not the background. If I had done an evaluative metering, that bird would have been a silhouette. Do you understand? So again, creativity when you come off auto. The little baby tit again, creativity. Look, I hope that you've learned something from this. And in order for me to keep doing this, please subscribe to my channel. That's going to help me making these videos for the future. Many thanks. Bye.